Henry Atkins, and Herbert Jacobs. Again, I bet it's going to be one of the craziest games you've ever seen. E4, E5, D4, E takes D4, C3. Of course, the whites could have played Queen takes D4. The blacks were going to answer that with Knight to C6. The whites are sacrificing pawns with the C3 move at the game. In exchange, they'll want to gain an advantage in terms of space and development. Now after c4, d takes c3. And here, Atkins continued with the bishop to c4 move. The Nordic Gambit, a second pawn sacrifice. If the blacks accept it, the white's bishop will be perfectly crossed after c takes b2 and bishop takes b2. Jacobs continued to play with knight to f6 against the bishop to c4 move, not taking the b2 pawn. He's gazing at the central pawn of his opponent. You should have a good understanding of Atkins by now. Since the opening, we can see that he hasn't cared much about his pawns. And here, Atkins continues to develop the knight to f3 move and says, you can take any pawn you want. Now, the knight takes e4, and kingside castling keeps developing. The whites face a serious threat, which is to demand the knight in the pin with rook to e1, therefore the knight to d6. He immediately emerged from that threat and demanded his opponent's bishop in c4. And what do you think Atkins played here? Do you think he took his bishop back or protected it? No, with the knight takes c3 move, he clearly shows that he doesn't care as much about his pieces as he does about his pawns. The knight takes c3, and he leaves his bishop open. Now the knight takes c4. Since the opening, the whites have sacrificed two pawns and a bishop. And what did he get in return? He is way ahead of his opponent in development. And the blacks have only developed the knight thus far, but overplayed the knight. and now there's a black king in the center. Of course, Atkins' goal here is not to win material with queen e2. His main target is the rival king, therefore rook to e1. Now the bishop to e2, knight to d5. He demanded the bishop in the pin, therefore knight to c6. The blacks are protecting its bishop by developing. And now the bishop to g5, from Atkins, once again willingly demanding for the bishop in the pin. Now that the blacks couldn't protect the bishop with any piece, they had to make the f6 move. But this move weakens the h5 to e8 cross in particular, and we will soon see how critical this is. After f6, the bishop is on demand. I'm going to ask you one more time. You must know Atkins very well now. You think he pulled his bishop back? No. With the rook to c1 move, the game's last non-active piece, the rook, was brought into play. Now if the knight in this c4 gets out of the way, the idea of rook takes c6 and then e7 looks pretty dangerous. Before I go to the black's move, here now, the blacks have taken two pawns and a bishop since the opening. He should have said, that's enough material winning. He should have secured his king with a kingside castling, saying no need for greed. At the game, however, Jacobs chose to protect his bishop with the b5 move. Actually, it surprised me. I expected a knight takes b2 move from the blacks. So after b5, Atkins says, if you don't get it, I'll give it to you. With the rook takes c4 move, this time he made an exchange sacrifice. Why did he make exchange sacrifice after b takes c4? Because the target is e5 square. He did it to sacrifice another piece, his knight, with the knight to e5. Now the most serious threat of the whites. The idea of knight takes c6 and then rook takes e7. At the same time, with the knight to e5 move, the queen's cross has been opened 
allowing to join the attack from the h5 square. But for the blacks, it is possible to take many pieces in many ways. The bishop can be taken, or the knight can be taken, in two different ways, before I got to the blacks' move at the game. Taking the knight was the best response for the blacks in this situation. This could be done in two ways, but it would be a little better to get it with a pawn with f5 to e5. As an example, it might go on like this. Knight takes e7, knight takes e7, the rook takes e5, he attacked the knight in the pin and the rook to f8. Now if the whites don't hurry, they want to support their knight in the pin with the f7. The rook takes e7, the queen takes e7, the bishop takes e7, and the king takes e7. Yes, the blacks gave the queen, but in return, they gained a serious material advantage. Yes, the black king may be in the center, and you may be wondering what will happen, but, for example, queen to d5. Now c6 with a double attack. Queen to e4 check, king to f7, queen to c4, d5, queen takes c6. And after a bishop to e6, the blacks are going to take their king to safety. And with two rook and a bishop against the queen, he must win this game with material advantage. And he has a pawn here. However, against the knight to e5, the blacks are probably making the last move they should have made, choosing to take the bishop with the f to g5 move. But now the queen to h5 check was pretty effective. Of course, because of mate, it is impossible to get the king out of the f7 square. That's why the g6 is a one move. Now that the rook is in the pin, you're thinking about the knight takes g6, right? No. Atkins changed his mind once, therefore the knight to f6. What kind of attack is this? Now after the knight to f6, because king f8 will be mate to queen h6 once more, the blacks must accept the knight sacrifice as well. The bishop takes f6. So why did Atkins sacrifice his knight? To open it with the knight takes g6 move, so that he can make a king tempo. Now after the knight takes g6, before I got to the black's move, using a knight or a bishop to counter this threat would result in the knight taking h8 and then the queen f7 mate. That's not possible. Black king to f7 could also be played against knight takes g6. And here you can stop the video and think about it. How can the whites win? It'll be a very useful tactical exercise. Jacobs prefers the queen e7 move against the knight takes g6 move. He's doing what he should have done earlier, but he's a little late for that. He says, I'll give you the queen, and in return, I can save my position by taking a lot of material of whites, but after the rook takes e7 check, the most resilient response would be the king d8 move, which would extend the game for the blacks a little longer. However, if the knight takes h8, the whites will win easily. With the material advantage, and the black king is very weak, of course. Therefore, queen to e7, rook takes e7. The blacks chose to take the rook with the bishop takes e7 move instead of playing king to d8. Once again, I want you to stop the video and think about it. The whites play and mate in five moves. Well, of course, we're going to make a discovered check. But how should we start this? Knight e5 check. The king to f8 won't work because there is mate. That's why king to d8, now knight to f7, king to e8, knight to d6, king to d8, and here comes that perfect move. Queen, e8, check. Herbert Jacobs left the game here.
because after the rook takes e8, the knight to f7 would somehow end up with a smothered mate. I mean, would you look at this? Incredible. It's just unbelievable. The blacks have two rooks, two bishops, a knight, and a pawn in front. But the white knight alone was enough for checkmate. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you enjoyed this video, please like, leave a comment, and subscribe to this channel, and click on the bell icon to stay updated with my new videos. Hope to see you in the next videos. Take care!